So today's topic is talking about solving password management problems. And there's a lot to talk about. There's really a lot to unpack. I normally do this presentation an hour and a half, but I want you to be able to ask questions. So I'm going to move fairly quickly. And don't worry, with the recording, you can always go back and watch it at your own pace. So, oops. Let's click again. There we go. Today's agenda is talking about the password problem in general. We're going to talk about password mistakes. We're going to take a look at the worst passwords of 2019. What is guessability? What is entropy? We're going to talk about some big targets, reusing passwords. Uh, what's the difference between security versus convenience? And do you have to pick between them? And then I hopefully will be able to demo some of this. So here we go. What is the password problems? Well, passwords are annoying. Now, there is technology out there that's trying to um, replace passwords with something that's more user-friendly. But for now, it's one of those necessary evils. So I have a few tips for you. First of all, avoid the temptation of taking the easy way out. Uh, the easy way would be reusing your password over and over and over again, or... Uh, I know a lot of us are creative with our passwords, but coming up with passwords in our head, um, that is not a great way to keep your account secure. You really don't want to come up with the idea in your own mind. Um, there's actually an easy way to do this. And, you know, it's not quite what you're thinking about. You would think, well, I'll just pick a password out of my head, change a few characters, we're good to go. The easy fix is actually an application. You let the technology do it for you. So, some things to avoid. Don't choose guessable passwords. For example, password. Not a very good password. As I mentioned earlier, don't reuse passwords. And don't assume that by using a password manager, you're giving up your inconvenience. It's quite the opposite. I actually find it more convenient to use a password manager. So right here is a list. I couldn't fit them all on the screen, uh, so I picked the top 30, I believe, are on this list. These are the most common, and they are in order from left, going down the left side, then the middle column, then the right column. Do you recognize something on this list? I hope not, but if you do, uh, you very easily could have your account compromised. This is a database that hackers and crackers have to use and inject your passwords into a login screen and don't think they're going to amazon.com clicking the login button and then filling in this information oh no oh no no they actually have access on the back end where they can inject password after password after password after password and they don't get blocked with those oh you've already entered your password wrong five times it, the system doesn't care they're on the back end of it so it will let them use all of these passwords go through all the dictionary list, and then it'll also let them start trying to crack into it. So even if you use a unique password, they still have access to it. So guessability, guessability is good for us, but it's not so great for computers, for passwords. For example, a common word like sunshine, that's something you can look up in the dictionary. We, th we take that word and we might add a numerical value to it, maybe one, maybe two, maybe a, a year or a series of numbers that you think are only meaningful to you. So that's the first step is adding a number is a good part to the password, but taking that common word is not the right beginning. Changing the characters up. Now this is creative. So that third bullet point there is indeed sunshine one but we replace some of the characters like the S with the dollar sign and the U because we're, you know, brilliant. We replaced it with the parentheses because it looks like a U to us. They get this. They know these tricks. This does not help you. It is not the best way to do it. Sometimes we'll use password patterns. So you might recognize the first one. That's the top row of your keyboard there. Maybe you'll just swipe your hand across the numerical keypad. Well, that's not so great either. So all of these patterns are easily guessable. Another thing that people will do is use quotes. So I have a quote here from Shakespeare. 
you think, oh, great, I'll put this in. Maybe I'll replace the spaces with hyphens or underscores. Do not do that. Again, these are things that are in their arsenal. They're ready to actually go out and use this against you. Any combination that you come up with, it's still a pattern. We as humans look for patterns in everything. When we look up in the clouds and the stars, we see all sorts of different shapes and items that it's just the way we are. So computers can feed off of that. Another thing is using names. So I was being clever here. And instead of saying Bill Gates, I went and looked up what his, well, real name, what his uh, birth name is, William Henry Gates III. And you think, oh, that's great. Nobody or very few people know that. Well, that's something you can easily find. So don't use names. That's not a good idea as well. Just remember, you are not fighting a person sitting at a computer typing on their screen into your login. You're fighting a computer. You're fighting a machine. It's an automated process. Brute force searches, those are also getting better over time. And I want to show you what I mean. So this is a website I came across uh, recently and it shows the amount of time it takes to crack a password. So people always ask me, how long does my password need to be? Well, here's a good indication. If your password is only seven characters, it takes less than a second to crack it. Less than a second. Isn't that crazy? Add one character to that and all of a sudden you're up to five hours. Still not very good, but that one additional character makes it that much harder. So as we add 9, 10, 11, we're up to one decade, and 12 characters, we're at two centuries. So my rule of thumb here is, and by the way, this will get easier over time. So 12 characters will be easier to crack as computers get faster. So my rule of thumb for now, <laughs> this will change, is if 12 disciples is good enough for Jesus, 12 characters is good enough for me. So I minimum try to make my my passwords 12 characters. Just a good rule of thumb. So what is entropy? Well, first of all, it's your friend. It actually, the definition of, def, definition of it is a lack of order or a lack of predictability. So look at this picture on the right-hand side. Hopefully this isn't a typical library or bookstore, but this actually has some entropy in it. There, yes, there's books on the shelves. Yes, they're probably in order, but look at all those books stacked in front of the shelves. It's just random. It's anywhere. Lord, I couldn't imagine trying to find a book in that pile. I'm sure someone knows what it means, but adding this complication to your password is what we want. This is what we want to do when we create our passwords. So, Let's take all those examples from earlier, character sets, numerical values, changing things up, and take a, large, uh, take a, uh, a, a look at an example here. In that character set, we have protagonist. And do you see how it's all changed? Now, there's still a pattern in that, but the good first step is there is, um, we're introducing all those different elements to this password, so that's a good first step. But now we got to take that pattern out of it. We don't want to use protagonist because that's something we can easily guess. We talked about length. So if you're ever asked a security question, you know, they're so secure. Uh, you're setting up an account, you give them a password, and they ask you, what's your mother's maiden name? Okay, that's something that I can find, and it's easy to find. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll use a password manager and generate a phrase and give it some length. So not one word, not two words. Maybe I'll use three, four, or five. So you create a random set of words for the answer to that question that should be obvious. And then you allow the password manager to remember that information, which is great because I'm not going to remember Studio Wanted Catalog Unshaved as my mother's maiden name for Apple and then it's something else entirely for Amazon or Microsoft. So you allow your password manager to, one number one, create it, and then remember it. So the last piece to that is, it is actually adding that randomness. So that password that you see right there was generated by a password manager. I didn't pick that. It has no rhyme or reason to how it's set up. That would be a good password. 
here's some big targets. Let's say you have a Facebook account and you use your standard password, whatever, monkey123, password123, whatever it is. And then Target says, oh, let's sign up for account. And you say, I got to remember another password. Well, of course, it's monkey123. So you reuse that password at Facebook, Target, eBay, the IRS, wherever. What happens is these targets, these big targets where you've used a, what you think is a secure password, somebody cracks into their database and it happens all the time. I mean, it, we're numb to the news anymore. We just ignore it. The whole big thing with Equifax that happened. Um, they didn't they got a slap on the hand and that was it so there's no correction to this behavior so it's going to keep happening so they crack in your facebook and then they try that username that password on all these other websites so be very very careful password lists are stolen leaked and hacked all the time that means when they break into that one account they're going to try it everywhere else can you imagine having your Facebook account hacked, who cares, right? You create another Facebook, but then all of a sudden they have access to your banking information or PayPal or Gmail. Here's the big scary thing. If they have access to your email, now they can go in and reset your passwords on all your accounts and lock you out of it. And I don't know about you, but I have not found a 1-800 number for Google to call and say, can you help me unlock my account? They have email as the automated process. So the moral of this story is you need to let technology do the hard, heavy lifting. You need to let a password manager, which is essentially just a list or a database, you need to have that manage all this information for you. You need to have the password manager generate these passwords for you. Don't try to make things hard. Let technology, technology is here to enhance our lives, so let it enhance those let it enhance protecting of your accounts online. That doesn't mean you're giving up convenience, quite the opposite. You are more secure using a password manager. And in my opinion, and I won't say all the time, but most of the time, it's more convenient. I'm going to give you an example. If I need to create a password for uh, an iPhone or any Mac device that I buy, or let's say I buy a new Windows computer, or I buy a Chromebook. So those are three different login accounts. Apple has an Apple ID, Chromebooks have your Gmail ID, and Microsoft's gonna ask for your Hotmail or Outlook ID. This is an example of Length is important, so you can create a 60 character password, but for these accounts, probably not a good idea, and here's why. You go to the Apple Store, you need your iPhone swamp, swap, they say, uh, we need you to turn off iCloud. Please enter your password. No problem, password manager enters it in, you're good to go. They hand you a new phone, and the first thing you have to do is what? Enter your password. Well, you haven't, integrated a password manager yet. So when you're talking about convenience, there is one thing to think about. For those accounts that you sometimes, sometimes need to manually enter that password, maybe your Wi-Fi password, consider making it 12 characters and no more. Yes, you can do less, but remember the slide from earlier, the less you have, the easier it is to crack, and 12 was that ridiculous amount of time. So you have to choose what works best for you. I wanted to talk about more than just the password manager that I'm going to demo today because there's some really good ones out there, honestly. I will even go as far as to say Bitwarden is not my favorite. Bitwarden is the choice that I, I use, but there's a reason for that. So Bitwarden has become my go-to password manager because it works on a Mac, on a PC, on Linux, on the web, on an Android phone, on an iPad, on an iPad. So basically it works everywhere. And even when I have a device where it's not supported, although I don't know what that would be because Chromebooks now can use Android apps, but let's say you have an old Chromebook, I can still go to bitwarden.com, log in and grab my passwords. So Bitwarden is fantastic when it comes to cross-platform uh, compatibility. 1Password actually was my favorite up until a couple years ago. And you can actually thank John Kennedy for uh, the presentation on Bitwarden because he's the one that introduced me to Bitwarden. My problem was 
I was using multiple platforms and didn't have a solution that met all my needs. So I switched from one password. I went to Bitwarden. I used the free account for a long time for at least a year. I guess it's not a long time, but I used a free account for a year. Cost me nothing. There was a few features I was missing, so I decided, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pay for it. So I now pay, I don't have the family account, which is $12 a year. Um, I pay $10 a year for Bitwarden versus one password wanted to charge me $60 a year. And the, the, the part that was difficult with that is I already gave them a bunch of money. I paid for the app outright on all those platforms. And then all of a sudden they said, we need you to pay per month. I, I'm not opposed to that, but I already gave them a lot of money. So I switched for two reasons, cost and the fact that it works everywhere. This is the ranking from Consumer Reports. Uh, if you, side note, if you are a member of your public library, please check to see, you might have access to uh, Consumer Reports, complimentary access to Consumer Reports, and that's where I found this information. So if you're wondering where this list came from, I have the URL down there at the bottom and a screen, quick screenshot of uh, three of them on the right. So now I'm going to demo password manager for you. Let me jump over to Firefox. And by the way, here is the uh, website for, I'm close to Columbus, Ohio. So I am a member of the Columbus Public Library system. And here I can view consumer report access, which is this article right here. I'm not logged in. I don't want to uh, produce any issues with copyright. So this is what you see when you just go to consumerreports.com from a simple search. But when you log in, you actually- yes, I, need, I need you to stop a second because we lost your sh uh, sharing. So we need you to start sharing again. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> is that better? Better. Okay. So what I was saying is this, this is the Columbus, Columbus Public Library website. And then there is the link. And then right here under password managers, this is what Consumer Reports shows you if you do a simple search for it. So first things first, what we need to do is come up with a, before we create our account, our password manager account, we need to generate a secure password. So I'm going to give you a hall pass for this one. Think about this logically. You need to create a password that you remember you could, of course, write it down on a sheet of paper or put it in a secure note on your device, whatever you need to do. At some point, the login for your password manager needs to be, as I said, a minimum of 12 is my recommendation, but I can change this. I can go down to 10. You need to include all of these elements, uppercase, lowercase, number, symbols, okay? So when you select this from a password generator website, which this is lastpass.com, slash, I can't see the whole thing, but it's like password hyphen generator. You can select the options you want here and then click the generate button. So here's a password. Let's say I like it. I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to paste it. So I'm just going to open up a text editor here and paste that one. Now I haven't committed. What I'm doing here is I'm generating a list of potential passwords. Let's say I like that one. So again, I paste that. This is for future use, remember, because in the meantime, we still have to, there we go, we still have to remember how to get into our password manager. So do this, set up your account and do this and try to find something better. You will want to change your password manager login using something like this, a password generator. It does all those elements, entropy, and then all the different items, upper, lowercase numbers and symbols. Okay, so we are ready to go. So we go to bitwarden.com or whatever password manager you choose. Not all <laughs> password managers fit everyone's needs. You, I encourage you to actually go out and look at LastPass. There's a free account. I encourage you to go look at 1Password, which is the top ranked, uh, ranked right now, and look at Bitwarden. Keep in mind your use case. Since I use it on so many different devices, I have to use Bitwarden. And it's fantastic. It's a really good password manager. There's just a few things that it's missing I wish it had. So pick the one that works best for you. So on their website, you'll see this big old button that says create your free account. So we click that button. It's going to ask for an email address. 
So I type in whatever email address I want. I put in my name. I put in my master password. I Okay, good. It doesn't show you. So, well, you know what? Uh, let's use one of those really bad passwords as an example of what not to do. So see how it says it's really weak? And I'll show you what it is. Monkey123. Okay, well, we're going to do an at sign and uh, underscore and an H. And it's still, it says it's good. But remember, this part of it is bad. And then we're only really cracking for additional characters. So this is not an indication that your password is good in the entropy sense. It just means it's good enough for them and they'll take it. So you retype the password. And then, of course, you type in a hint if you want. Click Submit. That sends an email to you where you have to verify your account. So you verify your account and you log in. So here's a login from Bitwarden's website. Bitwarden.com, big old login button right here. So enter your email address, enter your master password, and then log in. I have not installed anything on my computer. I'm just logging in from the website. If you're in a public library and you need access to your password managers, I would suggest you do this first. Every web browser has it. New private window. That way it doesn't save cookies, history, things like that. Go to your password manager website and log in. I'm on my own computer, so it's okay. So here I could look up um, an email address, for example. So here's my email address, and right here, I can copy my password. I can even launch the website. So if I click that, it's just going to open up. Uh, well, I got to change that URL, but normally it would open up gmail.com. And actually, yeah, that's fine. So we open up gmail.com, and then I'm already logged in. So I'm going to go ahead and log out. Go ahead and log out. It's OK, I promise. Okay, so it would take me to this website. I would use the email address that it provided, which was help. And then I would have it autofill the password. I actually am blocking some of my buttons here. Let me move some stuff around. So right here, I have integrated the password manager inside my web browser. And because of that, what I did before was I was on the web page, click the link, and then it it gets me to the page. It's a manual process. A lot of times you have to paste the password in. But here, using the integration in Firefox, it also works with Chrome, Edge. I think it still works with Internet Explorer. Um, all the major web browsers it works with. I can just click this button. Now, since it's the first time I launched it, it probably won't autofill. What it normally does is show you this. If you've already launched this, what it would do is magically fill in the password, and then you click Next. So I have a two-step verification set up for this, which is a good idea. That's another security measure to use when you're setting up on your online accounts. It's not something we're going to go into today, but good idea to do it. So at this point, after I say, yes, it's me, I verify that it's myself, I have access to my email account. So let's talk about... I'm going to go ahead and log out here. Don't forget to do that when you're in a public place. Let's talk about the integration. So I go to bitwarden.com. Uh, unless you're using a Windows 10 S device, you may not know what that means. There's multiple versions of Windows, but there's a particular version of Windows that only allows you to install apps from their app store, kind of like your iPhone and your Android phones. Bitwarden is available there. So you wouldn't do that for some of what I'm showing. You would actually go to the store and do it. So I'm on a full-fledged computer here, uh, no restrictions. I'm going to go to bitwarden.com and click the download link. When I go there, it shows me all sorts of stuff. Do you want it uh, installed on your Windows computer, on your Mac, in Linux? Sure. So you click Windows. It downloads the file you're off to the races. You will need to run the installation file, follow the default prompts, and then you'll be presented with a login for your password manager. The login on your desktop and the login here are all synchronizing with one another. 
Bitwarden is controlling that sync process. So even though I've installed it on Windows, but I started it on a Mac, everything will be in sync, no big deal. The next piece to this is the web browser integration. So scroll down just a little bit and you'll see web browser. You have to know what you're running. Some people I know, they don't know that. So a lot of times you can go up to about or sometimes it'll say it here or in windows, you go down to the uh, taskbar and you look for the icon. So there's my icon, look, match the icon up, great. I click this link, now I've already installed it. So it's gonna say remove, don't wanna do that. So you'll be presented with their, sort of like an app store, it's an add-on or an extension to the web browser. And then right here, you would see install or add, depending on which browser you use. So the installation process is pretty straightforward. I suggest setting up your account first, bitwarden.com or lastpass.com or whichever password manager you choose, and then going through this download process. So once it's installed, here on my toolbar in Firefox, and in Safari, it's a little different. Uh, I'll actually open Safari and show you since I'm sure we have some Mac users. But on Chrome and Edge and Firefox, it shows up on this right-hand panel. So these are all the extensions I have. This blue shield, uh, well, blue and white shield that I have here is the password manager for Bitwarden. The other password managers will look different. As far as the app goes, it's the same icon on a Mac. I've actually pinned it to my dock right here. And when I open it, it presents me for the first time, it's gonna ask me my email address. Now I've already used my password manager on my Mac, so it knows who I am. So all I do is type my master password and unlock. So once I'm here, I prefer to use this particular app because it does more. What, how you use the password manager is really up to you. You can create and generate passwords from the web. You can create and generate passwords from the app. You can uh, create new accounts here. So let's say I wanted to sign up for a new Apple ID. I can actually do that here. But what you decide to do is up to you. You need to follow your own path. So I'm gonna try something. Uh, you know how demos are. <laughs> we'll see how well this goes. If it doesn't work, I'll go back to my old method. But I'm gonna go ahead and go to um, appleid.apple.com. I'm going to kind of create a, an account here. So whichever website you go to, you need to find the option that says create. So right here on Apple's website, let me make it a little bigger, is where we create our Apple ID. So I click that. <clears throat> And then I enter my information. So birthday, you remember, you can lie about this. And I know a lot of you want to, um, but you got to remember the lie. So whatever you pick here, make sure you remember it. I'm not giving them my real birthday. It's none of their business. So I'm going to go ahead and use my email address. And right here, I can create a password. Now, I think I'm going to try doing it from this section. We'll see what happens. So you click the Bitwarden icon and you click this generator button. And then <laughs> I know some of you are, you think I'm crazy for doing this, but I typically do 60 characters. Well, for today's example, I want to show you a, a little tip. So I'm going to make this less. I'm just going to make it 12 because of one thing I would almost never make a password 12 characters unless it was something I needed to manually type from time to time. So 12 characters. And then you choose the options you want. You can set a minimum amount of numbers or special characters. You can avoid ambiguity if you need to. But at the top of this is the randomly generated password. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. Easy, right? So it's copied it. I can use keyboard shortcuts, excuse me, keyboard shortcuts. I can right click, choose paste, whatever method you want, you just paste. Okay, now here's the trick. Banking websites are notorious for this. I wanna create a super secure 128 character password for my banking account. I don't care how long it is because I don't type it. Anytime I bank, I go to the banking website and fill it in. 
it's not like you go to the bank and they say, what's your password? And you read a underscore pound. Blah. No, they're not going to ask you for that. They, they verify your ID a different way. So on a website, I can make it 128 characters if the website allows. So here's my trick. When I first start putting in a password, I will go backwards and count the number of characters it put in. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We're good, right? But what if you had a longer password, okay? Apple's website, thank you Apple, is actually uh, telling you the maximum. Now, I don't agree that there should be a maximum, but at least they're telling you it can't be more than 64 characters. So for this particular website, I'm good. I know I have to go in and generate 63 characters or less. So my practice again is go backwards and delete the password. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Most websites don't tell you, hey, you can only put 63 characters. It just truncates the end of it. It'll put in the first 12 and then after that, nothing. And what happens? You lose access to your account. So just a tip and trick from me, put in your telephone number and then it's asking how do you want to verify, make your choices, um, do your CAPTCHA here and continue. So I'm not going to actually create this Apple ID. I don't want another Apple ID. When I do create it, what typically happens, not always, but what typically happens is your password manager will pop up this little box. In this case, in Firefox, I believe it shows up at the top all the way across. It'll say, hey, you just created a password. Do you want me to remember it? Of course, the answer is yes. So this is a very easy way to do it. The reason why I don't follow this pattern is I don't trust the website to act properly. So typically, I go to the password manager program. I click the plus sign and I fill in the details myself. And if I have multiple, I might uh, do something like this. This is how you find it. This is not the username. The name is how can you find it if you wanted to do a search for it here? What makes sense to you? Now, this username is very important. It has to be what the website wants. And then the password, I click the generate button right here. And in this case, I need to change this because right now it's giving me characters, passphrase rather. So I'm going to go to options. And instead of passphrase, I want password. I pick the length. We know that Apple doesn't allow more than 63. So maybe I go 62 tab. As soon as you tab out of that, if all your options here are correct, you have your password. I'm going to be safe. You don't need to do this, but I'm being safe. I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to save it. I, again, I'm just being safe. I've never yet, knock on wood, I don't have real wood, run into an instance where it didn't actually save the password, but we're being safe here. So I'm going to go ahead and click this checkbox. There's my password. Now here's the annoying part of this. You have to remember the website ID. So best to put in, I do this manually, HTTPS. You don't have to, but I prefer to force secure connections. If you don't put anything in, it's going to go with the default. So it might choose HTTP instead of HTTPS. So I force this. Then I can go in and make notes. I can organize it in folders, which I've created these folders ahead of time. Um, note section is actually pretty helpful. If you're changing a password, I will often do this. Old password. Today's date is the 15th. So I get my old password first and I paste it there. And then I generate a new password. So I want to make sure I still have access to the old password for some time. The reason is <laughs> you might go to the website and it says, sure, you can change your password. What's your old password? Oh, crud. I already I overwrote that password. I have no idea what it is. Well, if you put it in your notes section here, you now have the new one and you have the old one. And I could just come here, copy, website paste, and then allow it to fill the new one for me. So these are all Kenneth tips and tricks, best practices that I've actually learned. Really, you have to do what works best for you. So the, the, the thing with password managers, the topic is vast. 
I encourage you to go out and start exploring which password manager you want to use first. Try them all if you want to. Yes, you can export and import from one password manager to the next, but go in and try stuff before you commit. This Bitwarden password manager is amazing, but it may not fit all your needs. So I'm going to go back to my presentation here and show you a few resources and then we'll have time for some questions. So these resources here will be in the presentation that's uploaded on APCUG's website. They're just different things I've come across and they're also some of the articles I've talked about today. So that is coming. So there you have it folks. That's a abbreviated version of how to use a password manager. Do we have any questions? I think we do. Um, somebody had a question about why, and you've answered it, that because you started out with the uh, web version about syncing uh, the passwords to a local computer so you would have it. But since the app is on the computer and the um, extension is on the web, you get the best of, of both. But he, here, here's a big question I know that a lot of people are saying. So we're creating these giganta, gigantic uh, passwords that are so confusing. How do you keep your local one, that master password, safe so that you can find it or remember it or whatever? Because, you know, some of that is still kind of tricky. So how do you keep that one safe? Great question. And in my extended version, <laughs> I definitely talk about that. You've got I, time. <laughs> I should have anticipated that and put it in the presentation, but the, there's no silver bullet. It depends. So I'm going to give you an example. My father, I uh, will say persuaded him to use a password manager because between him and my mother, they kept resetting passwords and then all of a sudden, oh, I, somebody sent me an email, I can't get into it, help me. So I tried to help, I tried to log in because I knew the password before and they changed it. So I, uh, truthfully, I forced them to use a password manager and it actually ended up working out better for them as well. I, I made them use a password manager for one reason. I had them store their passwords in there, but I had them give me their master password. I have the master password to Bitwarden for them in my password manager. Now they generated the password, they created it and they came up with something they liked. But if they ever get locked out of it or, you know, reality is we don't live forever. So if I need to get, gain access to some of their accounts, I now can do that because I have their master password saved. Another option is to remember, you want to keep this password secure. This is the keys to the kingdom. So a lot of apps on our mobile devices um, have note-taking applications. Some of them offer a section called secure notes. If you can find something like that where you can put it on your mobile device but secure it, Apple Notes actually has this feature built in. Do that. The other option is, of course, uh, pen and paper works great. Uh, I know a lot of you are using a book full of passwords that you write down. Uh, they're probably not randomly generated, but that's okay. So you can temporarily write that down in a location that's secure. If you want to keep it written down and you want to give that to um, your kids or anybody else that may be taking over for you when you can't, put it in a safety deposit box. So there's no right answer or one answer, but there's multiple ways to do it. How about going back and uh, reviewing those people who are currently using um, a password manager or have their passwords in a spreadsheet that they re refer to about getting them into Bitwarden? Yes. So is it okay if I go back to a previous slide? Absolutely. So right here, you'll see the third bullet point down. I specifically put in importing data from LastPass. The reality is LastPass is the largest. There is an article, there are help uh, desk articles all over the place talking about how you import data. Where you wanna start 
is where you're going. So if I just decided to move to Bitwarden and I need to import my password from somewhere, go to bitwarden.com, look at their help articles, and then find the one that meets your needs, importing from a spread spreadsheet, importing from LastPass, importing from one password. So there's articles everywhere. And I do give you the one for LastPass here. And I can say that I had no problem importing my last pass into Bitwarden. It was a breeze. And I imported from one password and I had hundreds. You'd be surprised how many online accounts you uh, gain over the years. I had hundreds that imported. I had very minor cleanup. I had a few duplicate entries where it only brought in the URL and I said, well, that's useless. But otherwise, I was off to the races. I had no stumbling blocks. Okay, here's, here's one. Um, what about if you have a standalone program that requires username and password, such as Steam? Steam ah. is download. So it comes up and asks you for a password and whatever, but it's not in the browser. Yes, correct. Great question. I have to demo that. I yep. have a Steam account. So you ready? I open my password manager. This is where you would want to have, you don't have to, but you really do want to have this on your computer installed. So I log in, I type Steam, and then I know the username, so I copy. And actually, I don't think I have Steam installed on this uh, computer. Uh, let me see. I do not. Uh, I'm not going to download it, but essentially, you have to know some keyboard shortcuts. So I've copied this password. Where did it go? It's in a temporary storage space. And the way you, I, oh, I better not pass. Uh, let, me, let me copy my username. I don't want to uh, advertise my password everywhere. And let's oh. play make-believe. <laughs> so here's my Steam client, right? So my login, it's asking for, I type that in. And then the password field, it says, please enter your password. So the, the, the keys on a Mac is command V as in Victor, will paste what you copied. Command C is copy, command V is paste. So you just command V or on a Windows computer, I think Linux as well, control V. So control V on Windows, command V on a Mac, and then you hit enter and you're off to the races. Thank you. That was the good answer. And that's an advantage of having the, um, the, the, the uh, thing. Oh, I know. The, the advantage of having the web browser is that you can go to any computer anywhere and go to Bitwarden and get your stuff. You kind of mentioned that. Yes. Uh, but that's very helpful because I've been someplace and I've wanted to get in and I'm going, oh, I can't remember my password. Uh, I have another question. That was it. Do hackers still get passwords from key loggers? Uh, hackers are using every tool at their disposal. And thank you for asking this question because that reminds me of something that probably is a question in the chat. Um, has Bitwarden ever been hacked? Right? The answer is yes, they have. Has LastPass ever been hacked? Yes, they have. But here's what they got. Nothing. They got garbly gook. It was junk. It was all encrypted. So if your password manager that you choose doesn't encrypt the data, find another one. Bitwarden is great. One password is great. And LastPass is great. So yes, everybody gets hacked. It's If you're on the internet and you have a way to log into your system, it's just a matter of time. If you're a large target, well, that's funny, pun intended, I guess. If you're a large target like Target, um, of course, they're always trying to attack you. So you want to find one that encrypts your data. Uh, let's see, I was getting quick. Um, is giving the browser access to your password database a security risk? Well, it can be, yes. So if you are, if your computer has been hijacked, uh, you might get a pop-up saying, oh, you have a virus, call us or whatever. It could mean that it's just a pop-up from a website. But if your computer has been compromised, remember, you're unlocking your password manager. 
So at that point, you've unlocked the doors. If you have uh, zombies outside and you run in and you unlock your door and you leave your door open, well, the zombies are going to follow you in. There's no way to stop that. So you've got to make sure your computer is secure. You're unlocking it. You're encrypting it at that point. And really, you have other issues to worry about first, and then you're going to have to reset your passwords. But yeah, it's absolutely possible because it is using the clipboard in some cases. That's that temporary storage space. Yeah. I know that we can import the um, passwords from other things. Can you export Bitwarden passwords so you can have a printed copy to store somewhere? The answer is yes, but should you? <laughs> um, if you decide to do that, whatever you do, make sure wherever you store it, it's also protected, it's encrypted. And the how to do that is a whole other subject in and of itself. I don't recommend it. Um, I especially don't recommend it if you store it on OneDrive or Google Drive or something like that. But yes, it can be done. Okay. One last one I'm going to ask, and this is going to be important for the people who are uh, going to try and download this. One person said that when you click to add Bitwarden, a message pops up. It says, this program can read and change all your data on the websites you visit. Read and modify data you copy and paste. Is there a danger to adding this extension to your computer? That is an excellent question nobody's ever asked, so let's break that down. Any extension you install in a browser has access to do things. Bitwarden, LastPass, 1Password has to have access to write to your web browser. How do you think it's pasting the username and password? The question was, is this extension a risk? When you go looking for extensions on web browsers, you can if you want to, but I don't recommend going in and installing things that are not trusted. I'm going to show you back at, oops, sorry, back at Firefox. When we go to Bitwarden and we go to Firefox, download. Do you see this right here, recommended? Let me make it bigger for you. If it's not recommended by Mozilla, which is Firefox's parent company, yes, don't use it. You're taking a huge risk. This has been vetted by this web browser. So if you find a password manager and it's not recommended, it's probably not very secure. Look elsewhere.